Just a quick thing, we talk about digging plants and, and roots, so y'all y'all all get a picture, which y'all want to get a picture of this one, because I'm going to pull it right out. All right, so we got that. Now I tell you never to, it's different in Georgia than it is in any other part of the state, country. You pull up, well, not too bad. I pulled this one up and we in essence kind of dug this one. Look at what you see different, right? Y'all see a difference? How many times y'all just want to check and see what your crop looks like you would do what? You grab a plant, pull it out. Then you look say, huh, not as much nodulation as I thought. Well, it's because you freaking pulled it out. So dig it up. How many of y'all treat your soybeans? Get your beans treated. I really want y'all to go out. The definition of a good seed treatment is not what brand it is, because I can tell you the brand of plant to use, but it's, it is... Does it have enough fungicide and insecticide on it? Then if you're inoculating them or any of that, a good seed treatment is going to do one thing. It's going to make sure your tap root grows straight down. And if your tap root's going straight down, like we have here, that, that is telling me we have no compaction and we have a seed treatment that's protecting it. If you get a poor seed treatment, and there are certain times, you're not going to hear me say, more is better, but there are certain times a more seed treatment or a more particular active ingredient. I don't need to tell y'all, y'all have heard all that. Y'all could teach this class. But more fungicides or more active ingredient, not like above label rates, but it's kind of, have you ever looked at your label of something that says, hey, you need it uh, 0.5 or 0.75 ounces or four ounces to eight ounces? What, time, what do you think you're getting mostly? If you're paying for it, you're most, and somebody's doing it and they're charging you, you're probably getting more of the four pound or four ounce rate. If you get a, a poor seed treatment and this tap root gets some kind of infection, it's going to turn. So that's why I say if that tap root's not going straight down without compaction, we didn't, we need to re, we need to reevaluate our seed treatment. Um, the other thing that tap root is going down, you know, it's it's punching a hole looking for nutrients, and then we have, you know, just these mass. But if you were to just dig this, this is what you would have saw. Remember this, okay? There is a significant difference between what y'all normally would dig and all this is happening out in the middle. On soybeans, one of the things we soybeans like what fertilizers think about what fertilizer soybeans really covet nitrogen they make their own now we were uh yesterday i was here i think it was yesterday here and they say well when you get over that 60 bushel range they say you might need a little bit more nitrogen and they said 60 to 80. well you know i always thought well if you had eight the bean can make enough fertilizer for 80 bushel bean I think what they're saying is there's that transition between 60 to 80. So 60, you're probably good. 70, you need some. 80, you need a is significant more. What else? What other nutrient does this crop need? K, potash. Corn likes potash. Soybean likes potash. If you're in a corn bean rotation and you're on the heavier soil that most of y'all have, load up your corn crop with potash let the crop let it res that residue decay because corn will pick up more than it needs then now if the market price bears it and your wallet can bear it i'd put it on my corn crop and if i didn't do it on my corn crop we need potash on this crop so when it, when you're thinking about 2026 and you save dollars and 25 of fertilizer and you're going to go beans you need to think about potash that that's like a necessity in my book don't grow a crop single crop and say it's a poverty bean and we're just going to be happy with 40 50 60 bushels you're going to need if beans are going to be ten dollars you need bushels um, what's the worst thing for high prices is raising more bushels and when we got low prices we need more bushels um, so i'm impressed with this the other thing um, that i do want to say and i don't know what pgrs y'all use um, how many y'all use pgrs y'all use any out here yeah, it's fine. Um, <laughs> um, th there is a, there's this whole new biological arena workspace that we're we're finding ourselves in. PGRs, was, they, they, you know, whether some people say, well, PGRs are biologicals. All right, they're synthetic biological. And then you got bugs in a jug, 
and you know are they all fairy dust or whatnot but a farmer, I've heard, I've heard a guy say, a farmer will never give up something he knows pays. And I, I could almost guarantee that they had a PGR out here because when you go pull your plants, or what did I tell you to dig your plant, but when you've got a soybean plant in your hand, start looking at the number of pods you have per node or wherever the joint is. Most beans are gonna have that three or four pods that's not a cluster that's just a set but when you get here one two three four five six if you would normally just have three or four and then you made an application you just turned that into five or six what'd you just do almost doubled your yield on this on this node right here would you like to have say that you were responsible for that by just making an application and they only last so long. You know, some people say uh, seven, 10 days, two weeks. Now, I did hear, it was cool coming from a meeting yesterday. They said the average corn farmer sprays his crop uh, one point, I think it was, Dustin, do you remember? Or Dustin step out. Uh, 1.6 or eight times and soybeans 1.3 or four times outside of herbicide. So imagine the guys down here spraying all the time for what? Y'all got things that like to punch holes, and I don't think this is hail, but things that punch holes and they eat because they got insects. But if I would make an application, I could almost double the number of pods I have. That'd probably be a pretty good ROI. Now, the only downside is, and I think I heard you say last year, Alex, that on your beans, you had so many pods on the branches, they fell, out, they fell, they fell off. And, uh, or broke off and he didn't he could harvest all of them so thank god for all those trying to uh, catch up with you you didn't have your whole entire crop um i guess on, on the soybean side outside the root pit thinking about for 2026 and anybody here still blooming i'm still blooming yeah so if you're going to make a bloom and go make a spray so all right, you guys, I'm not going to stand here and say what products you use, but what do you, what do you use here when you're making sprays? Uh, we have KB, and then we have Revline Late Season, PGR, Smart KB, something like that. That's Patrick, what do, y'all, what do y'all talk about? Same. Same thing. Yeah. Same with Revival. Yeah. yeah. And then, you know, when, you know we like to use um, cytokines and IBAs before herbicide, and then, and then we're just like them, switching. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So, okay, let's wrap it up. Y'all got That's any a, questions for him? Got a time for a couple. Guy grew 600 bushels of corn. Somebody's got... And he's standing in a soybean field. <laughs> What's wrong? Somebody's got some questions. You need to put him in the field. <laughs> That's exactly right. Yep. What do you work on on Infura? We run a um, revival. Revival? Okay, for me it would be in an hour for in where I where we farm, you know, if you do a PGR and then we like iron and we like Molly. So all our beans are going to have Molly on the seed, but we also like to add Molly in the trench because we what does Molly do? Helps on that inoculation. I mean, it's big. And boron, now you don't want boron in the trench, but um, but we like the iron and and now there are some people say they want a fungicide where well, if you got a good seed treatment but I'm not gonna argue for the success for fungicides too. Add it on. Question we get a lot, Taylor. You probably be the man for this. How late a grower get an ROI on a on a PGR? You know, you get that question a bunch. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm flowering, but I'm past R3. I'm R4. Maybe one or two nodes flowering. Can I still? Is it is it worth? Is the juice worth the squeeze? If you have the fertility and water to make the yield happen. Gotcha. If you don't have those two, you can tell the plant to do whatever you want to. The plant might go backwards. You gotta have everything else in place. You have to have the factory built already. But if things are in place the way they should be, you can push them. We'll go up to R5, uh, pushing them with PGR. This is a crop that pays all your debt. Pay, allows you to keep farming. This part of the crop is what allows you to pay some of your interest down on some equipment, or maybe if you bought some land. This is the part that allows you to get a new pickup or take your wife out on a nice vacation or something like that. Let's remember that. We got to make sure we have, we, this is a necessity, y'all. So if, like Caleb was saying, you got to make sure you can finish it all. Let's make sure we got this stack.
Then we can work about this and then we can finish the crop out. This is exciting right here that we got two, four, six, eight, eight, and then there's probably another one there. So maybe nine, that cluster on top. His wife's gonna go somewhere nice on vacation. <laughs> All right, y'all. Hey, it's, I'm gonna be around. So um, I'll be around, I'll stay here for a while and then um, I'll be around during lunch and I'll be around till I have to leave. Yeah, all right, y'all. God bless. And um, one last thing, if y'all not part of Total Acre, go to TotalAcre.com and look into it. And there's a lot of Total Acre guys here. So thank y'all. Good deal.